Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Anyone have any questions? Okay, sounds good. Let's go ahead and get started uh, with uh, this week's stuff. We have a few different topics to cover, uh, depending on how much time these things take. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is some notifications to the user. And I'm not talking about notifications at the top of the screen. I'm talking about how you can give the user some feedback while they're actually running their application. There are three main types of notifications in this category that I'm talking about. There's a toast, a snack bar, and a dialogue. And each of these has a slightly different type of behavior and a different use case for them. Pardon me one sec. So a toast is something that temporarily pops up on the screen. It looks like this here up on the screen. Uh, and the user can't interact with it. It's just a little notification to say, hey, something happened. And that might be nice if the user knows something is about to happen uh, or is expecting something. And it's just a quick little confirmation. The user doesn't have to do anything to say, yep, OK, I saw that. A snack bar is also a temporary notification, but there's an optional user interaction component to it. You can put an action on it, like this press me action, and if the user hits it, it can do something. This you've probably seen in a number of applications where there might be an undo option there, like if you're deleting an email or something like that. Uh, so these ones, they're temporary, they will go away, and they give you the single action. Now a dialogue is one that the user has to do something about. It's going to stay up there until the user dismisses it. And the user may dismiss it by hitting one of the buttons or clicking outside of the dialogue. Clicking outside the dialogue dismisses it. And you can treat that the same as the cancel button, which I would generally recommend, or uh, have some other oper operation associated with it. The OK button is going to do something affirmative, so that it may perform some kind of action. Generally, the cancel won't perform any action. Now, when do you want to use each one of these types of things? Um, one of the first questions I always ask myself is, how easy is it for the user to make a mistake? Uh, if there's a button that's always on the screen, for example, uh, it's really common for somebody to accidentally hit the button. You know, maybe they fumbled their phone, maybe they have their thumb across, you know, over the edge of the phone a little too much. But sometimes it's really easy to hit buttons and things like that. In cases like that, confirmation dialogues are usually a pretty good idea there because, you know, especially if it's something that is a, a, a destructive action, you know, if you're deleting an object. Um, if there's a button in an overflow menu, so instead of having an action on the toolbar, maybe there's the dot, dot, dot overflow menu. And if the user taps that, it's a lot more likely if they tap something inside there that they're doing the action intentionally. So in a case like that, uh, maybe you're going to have some kind of a component that allows them to get the data back, like a trash can or, you know, you know a, uh, you know, uh, removed items uh, area or something like that. Um, or maybe you want to have some undo functionality. And the undo functionality could pop up in a snack bar, or it could be a little bit more robust, as we'll talk about later. Um, anytime that type of action does, if you, if you don't have a confirmation dialogue, you're going to want to have some kind of notification back to the user to say, hey, Action X just happened. So they're at least aware of something happened. And you know, maybe they go someplace like the trash can to find you know the item that they just accidentally deleted. Now you also ask yourself, how often does the user intentionally do an action? Uh, if you're deleting in an email, you know, deleting in your email application, you're gonna be doing that a lot. So the user is gonna say delete, 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 delete. They're not gonna want a confirmation dialogue popping up between every single dial, every single thing being deleted. So uh, that could be really annoying to the user. So a case like that, again, you may wanna have a trash can for it or have some kind of undo functionality so that after they delete it, they can say, whoops, I didn't mean to. That's the approach that Gmail took. They have, a tr they have the uh, trash folder to actually put deleted emails, but they also have that undo action. So the user can immediately undo the last one, but it only stays up for a little bit because you're using a snack bar there. Now you can also, if you don't want to give them a, a, a nice little undo on there, you could pop up a toast instead just to say, hey, I deleted something. If you want it back, go to your deleted folders, deleted items folder. Um, let's take a look for maybe a, a contacts application. If somebody's going to delete something in there, it's probably a fairly infrequent action. 
there's uh, the, you know, when you have a bunch of contacts, chances are you probably want to keep most of them because you took time entering them in. So deletion is probably not going to happen very often. So in a case like that, a confirmation dialogue is pretty useful because you can say, hey, do you really want to delete this? Because they're probably going to lose a good chunk of data. And it's really not going to be invasive because they're not going to be saying delete, 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 delete on, on uh, contacts in general. To do a dialogue in Jetpack Compose, it's actually pretty simple. Really all it is is just an overlay on top of your user interface. And you just have some kind of a Boolean value that you're going to, to check to see, should I display it or not? And if you have, you know, that Boolean is true, you're going to display the dialogue. If the Boolean is false, you're not going to display the dialogue. And there's really, uh, there's, there's the base dialogue, which is a really super uh, flexible class. You can do a whole lot in there. There's also alert dialogue, which is useful for more of the common cases. Um, now, one of the things you need to handle is what happens if the user clicks outside of the dialogue. And personally, I generally prefer that they have to hit the cancel button if they want to close the dialogue. I think it's too easy to accidentally bump something outside of the dialogue. So you can explicitly avoid that if you want to. Um, if you do prefer having the user being able to tap outside the dialogue, that's fine too. It's, it's kind of a preference on the application writer. Uh, I've just seen too many people, you know, they, the dialogue pops up and they accidentally tap part of the screen and it goes away and they're like, what, what did that say? And there's really no way to get it back at that point unless they redo the same action. In order to deal with undo, there's a few, few uh, common ways to do it. Um, one is uh, having it on the snack bar and you just keep track of enough information when you develop that snack bar to be able to undo the action. But another is more general, and that's using something called the command pattern. The command pattern is one of the gang of four patterns in the design pattern book. And the idea is that instead of having your user interface say, hey, delete this thing, or hey, do that, or hey, do something else. You have an intermediate object, and this intermediate object called a command, and he has an execute function in him that performs the actions. So from the user interface side, you're going to call something that creates a command or create a command yourself, and then execute it. And when you execute that, it has all the knowledge it needs to perform that execution. Uh, it also, uh, when you create the command instance, you could pass in all the data he needs to be able to do that execution as well. The command pattern has an extension on it for undo and redo, which you're just adding a couple extra functions there. And generally what will happen is the execute might keep track of a little extra data inside the object so that it knows what it needs to undo something or to, un or to redo something. And then when the, the user wants to undo, they can call undo on that and poof, it'll revert the action store whatever data is needed inside the command, and allow that command to be redone later on. To do this, you generally are going to have what's called an undo manager. And when I show you an example, I'm just going to kind of bake that into the view model itself. And you really need two stacks for it. You have one stack keeping track of what stuff can be undone, and you have another stack keeping track of, st of what stuff can be redone. And these are very, very similar to the back, and, and, uh, the, the back stack in a browser where uh, you can go backwards and forwards while you're doing your browsing. Your back stack is essentially your undo stack. It lets you go back to previous pages. And every time you go back to a previous page, the page you were on gets pushed onto the forward stack. So it's very, very similar to an undo manager. When the user asks to undo, we pop something off the undo stack, call its undo function, and then push it onto the redo stack. And then for redo, it's the exact opposite. We pop something off the redo stack, call its redo function, and push it onto the undo stack. This actually, you know, adds some complexity to your application, but it also adds some, uh, uh, some, some really nice definition to what's going on. And something very similar to this happens in uh, an architecture they call clean architecture. And in clean architecture, they have a layer called the use case layer or the domain layer. And in that layer, there are use cases which act very, very similar to commands. Generally, the use cases don't have undo and redo, but it gives you some common functionality that different user interfaces can use to interact with the same backend data. You know, for example, you might have an Android interface, you might have a web interface, you might have a command line interface, an iOS interface, whatever. And if all of your logic is common logic in that use case layer, each of those user interfaces can reuse that same common logic. And so it, it makes your logic on your user interface a little bit thinner um, at the expense of having another layer in there. If you combine 
this command idea with the undo and the redo with use cases, then you can set it up so that anything that you've interacted with can be undone. Now, depending on what you're trying to do in your application, maybe not everything needs an undo or a redo. You know, there might be a lot of things that are you know, just going to uh, send, an e send a message or something that you can't undo. In a case like that, you just you'd use the commands where you actually are modifying data. And so you get kind of a hybrid approach on it. So um, you could set it up so that all your modifications are commands and uh, you know, have that general uh, undo function. Or you know, maybe with a, a user interface, one of the things that could be really super useful, and I was playing with this a long, long time ago when I was doing some initial Java work. Let's say that you're writing an IDE or a word processor or something like that. Uh, in an application like that, if you set up your code so that all of the actions the user can perform are commands, and you give them all names. What you can then do is allow the user to edit that user interface. And so the user can drag things onto their toolbars, they can you know, assign key commands, and each of those commands and menu items, or, sorry, each of the, the actions the user can run, or the menu items, you know, the, the key presses, whatever, will execute one of these commands, which can then be undone via the undo menu. And this is, I think, probably one of the coolest things you can do with a command pattern. Is say, if you set up that every single one of your modifications are commands, you can then have a customizable UI. Now, this is really unlikely in Android. Uh, you just don't have the screen real estate for the user to set up a lot of customization. Maybe as we get into bigger devices, larger tablets, you might start seeing some of this. Uh, but I, I, I don't really expect to see it all that often, you know, but there are several applications out there that are really desktop applications that have this type of functionality. And uh, I would expect that they're doing something similar to this behind the scenes to allow the user to manage which commands they're doing. So that's all I want to talk about on the slides. Let's do some code. So I'm going to create a new project here, a new compose activity. And just a note, uh, Jetpack Compose 1.2 came out. Uh, I still want to keep using 1.1.1 for this class, uh, but I just wanted to mention that in case you notice that 1.2 comes out. You're going to see that it's going to tell us that the 1.1.1 is uh, back level now. So let's call this one Toast Snack Bar uh, and um, uh, Dialogue. And that looks good. And let's fix them up like we've been fixing up all along. I'm going to go to my build.gradle and make this 1.1.1. Make my Kotlin version 1.6.10. And just a note, the 1.2 version of Compose goes along with Kotlin 1.7. So it, you know, if there are certain features in 1.7 that you've heard about that you want, you can take advantage of that. OK, and then app, go up to his build.gradle. And let's hit Alt Enter on each of these. And then I'm going to resync it. Okay, now you notice that it's still saying these composed ones are back level because um, if I click on it, it's going to tell us 120 is available. Okay, so far so good. So now we've got a basic application. And what I want this application to do is just have a list of people on the screen that you can delete. I'm going to do this really super dirt simple. I'm not going to use a lazy column or anything like that. We're just going to put them in a column. We're going to have some people inside of a map. We're really talking about the interaction with the user to tell them things. I'm not going to worry about what's going on behind the scenes. Now, also, I'm not going to externalize strings. Make sure in a real application, you're always, always, always externalizing those strings because it just, once you get down to international, internationalization, it makes your life so much simpler. Um, the string externalization is one of the biggest parts. You also have for, for uh, internationalization, you also have to deal with uh, number formats, date formats, things like that, uh, and languages once you start to deal with that. Uh, and starting with your strings being externalized into that strings.xml is going to make that step so much easier. Uh, and that's one thing that I'm, I'm really happy about, uh, you know, because I'm working at Google now. Internally, they're really taking that seriously to try to be able to get as much reach as they can with different languages and different countries and making sure things feel normal for them. 
Okay, so let's take a look at what we're going to do in here. I'm going to create a little view model. Let's say new and, oops, I hit my caps lock. Um, let's call it person view model. And so we'll have a class person view model, which is an Android view model. Actually, I don't need to be an Android view model because I don't need the context. Whoops, what did I do there? That should be good. Okay. And so inside of here, what I want to do is just have a map of some people. Let's go ahead and define a person. So I have a data class person. And we're going to have a val ID. Actually, let's make it a, well, no, it's a val. I want to make them uh, immutable. And a val name. And a val age. Something like that. So there's a nice person that we can have there. And we're going to keep track of a map of those people and expose it to the user interface as a flow. Now, what I want to do is internally, I'm going to use a map, a Java map or a Kotlin map, which is going to have key value pairs. And we're going to start off by having private val people map. And let's say he's going to be a mutable state flow of map string person, something kind of like that. And we're going to start him off as an empty map. Now this map, I'm not going to expose directly to the user interface, to the user interface. All I want to expose to the inter user interface is going to be a string or a list of all the current people. So what I really want to do is get all the values out of there. And I'm going to use a map function to do that for me. Now keep in mind map function here is a transformation. It's not anything to do with this kind of map. So it's kind of an unfortunate name, but that came along from uh, functional programming quite a long time ago. The whole idea of mapping a piece of data from one value to another value. I really wish they would have used the word transform. I think it would have been easier for people to get in because the concept of that map function is something that, that tends to strike people as confusing when they're starting to go into uh, functional programming. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a new public flow here. I'm going to call people and I'm going to take the values from people map and convert them into uh, just the, the lists of people. So I'm going to say whenever people map changes, I'm going to take that value and I'm going, whoops, actually people map dot value.map. No, no, it's just people map dot map. That's right. And let's bring him in. There we go. And so that's going to bring in the, the next value from the current people map and let us see it inside here. And all I'm going to do is say map. Let's call that map as a parameter map dot values. So I'm going to get that list of people and let me go ahead and sort it by their name. So now if somebody subscribes to people from the user interface, they're going to see a flow of lists coming back. And each value that they get is going to be a list of people. Anytime we change people map internally, that's going to trigger anybody who's collecting this to see the value. So now that we've got him, let's add a couple functions that will actually modify that. So I'm going to say, let's give a... Um, delete function. Whoops. I got a new keyboard again. And this one's actually not one of the ergo keyboards and I'm doing much better with it, but still trying to get used to where the new keys are in here. So how do we delete a person? We're going to take that people map and just remove the person ID. Actually, I wanted to delete the person ID just so we only have to deal with the ID. And so I'm going to say people map that value. So the current item that the people map flow is holding on to mutable state flow just holds on to one at a time and exposes it as value equals people map dot value minus person id boom and so this minus operator is going to return us a new map a new immutable map without the key the item that was keyed by person id so that's how do you, we're gonna we're gonna delete that and let's add in a fun add person and we'll say ID string oops. 
and name is a string, and age is an int. This should be uppercase int. And I'm going to have a little internal function here just to kind of help. We'll see where it's used a little bit later. I'm just going to say private fun add person person. And he's going to do the actual update. So we'll come into here, make that be plus person. Now we'll notice that the plus doesn't like that because that's the value that we have. Whenever we're adding to a map, we need to get an entry object, which has a key and a value associated with it. We can create that entry object or a pair by saying person.id to person. So this to operator here creates a pair object and plus for a map allows a pair to be passed to it. And th that's really just an entry that you're going to be using inside the map. So this pair of the key is the ID, the value is the actual person, is going to get added to the map, creating a brand new map, and then we make that the value. Once that's the value, anybody listening to this guy are going to see it because this guy's changed. We're going to convert it into just the list of values and return it back to the user interface. So now let's put in some people into this. So instead of an empty map here, let's actually just give it a little initial list of people. And I'm going to say person P1, Scott, 55. And let's make three other people, P2, 3, and 4. And maybe let's put a mic in here. And maybe he's going to be five years old. And maybe a Sue. And she'll be 25 years old. And maybe a Martha. And she's going to be 30 years old. I bet you thought I was going to say 35. And notice how this also has to be a map here at this point. So we need to actually create the um, the list of uh, the, the keys keying to these. So we'd say P1 to that, P2 to that, P3, whoops, where's my undo? There we go. P3 to that and P4 to that. But we're actually creating a list object here, which we can't initialize. So I need to just change this to say map of. And the map of function takes a list of pairs and then creates a map out of it. Now notice because we're doing that, we have enough information here to know that we have a string and a person. So we don't need the types being specified there. So now we've got this nice little people map that we're going to start off with. We can add to it. We can remove from it. Fun stuff like that. Let's set up a little user interface that can actually do something with it. And just pardon me. I was just opening up my, my prep project over here just to make sure that I have things in shape. Let's take a look at our first uh, activity here. I'm going to delete the stuff down here and get rid of the grading. And let's create a little UE function here. So I'm going to say composable fun UE. And we're going to get our view model passed in. And what we've seen before for passing in the view model is that I created an, an instance up inside the activity and passed it down in. And we can actually use a function here called view model to pull in the view model that's scoped wherever this UE was created. We need to actually bring in another dependency for that to work though. And let me just grab him real quick here. There he is. I'm gonna go to build Gradle. He needs this lifecycle view model compose package here, which is going to contain that view model function for us. And so now I can just hit control space after that. And, oh, I need to sync it first. And then I control space, choose that view model, boom. So that's going to create that view model and keep track of it for us if we don't pass anything in. So now I can come up here and say UE, just like that, and boom, we'll have a view model appropriately. So what I need to do is be able to get that list of people so that I can display it on the screen. 
So I'm going to use my collected state one more time here. I'm going to say so val people by view model people collect as state initial is just an empty list so that if we haven't been able to collect anything yet we can bring that in i'm going to go ahead and do a import there there we go and so now that'll get our people and then we can actually just go ahead and put them on the screen so i'm just going to use a column to represent these for right now so i'm going to say column and then inside here people for each and let's just put a let's put a little row with the person's name and then a trash can icon to be able to delete them well actually let's uh, pass that into a separate ui i'm gonna say people ui passing in people wow people looks really weird there that's right though but you ever have one of those times when uh a word just doesn't look right, but that's right. People UE. And we're going to have people coming in, which is a list of person. And then inside here, actually, I just want to do this. Let's make the column inside here. And we can say people for each. And then we'll put a little row in here. And we'll have a text for the person's name. Yeah, let's say person. So person dot name, and the way I want to uh, create this on the screen is I'm going to make this first text field stretch to take up any remaining space. We're going to have two two fields next to each other, a text, and then an icon. And the icon I want to be pushed all the way to the end of this row. So it's going to be all the way over on the right when we're doing a right, uh, left to right layout. If it's a right to left layout, it'll obviously be on the, the left side. So I want to push that icon all the way over there. So, but, so I'm going to set the icon to just take up his space he needs. And the text field is going to have a weight to stretch it out. So we'll add a modifier in on that. And we will say weight 1F. And all the components that have a weight, we sum up those weights and we divide the remaining space available amongst them. Uh, let's put a padding on that as well. 8.dp. Okay, and then let's have an icon here. And so the image vector is going to be icons.default. Delete. There we go. And then we'll say delete person. Uh, again, this should be externalized. I'm just taking a shortcut here so that we don't chew up time on that. And I want to make it so that this guy, we're going to say he has a modifier with padding 8dp as well. And I'm going to make him clickable. So we need to have handle that click. We're going to do that like we've been doing everywhere else. Uh, let's actually call that composable. That might make things happier up there. Let's pass in a function here called onDelete, which we'll pass a person into, and do something with it, and not bother returning anything. So for the clickable here, we're going to say onDelete person. Boom. So now we have a nice little user interface that'll let the user delete things. We're going to need to handle this delete now. So if we come up to here where we're calling it, we're going to say people equals people on delete equals view model. Well, actually, we're just going to pass in the ID there. So we'll say view model dot delete it dot ID. So that should allow us to delete things. And when they're deleted, we should see them removed from the list. So hopefully this is all going to work. Let's give it a try here. We'll do it in an emulator. And we see that, oh, that's from a previous run. Ignore that. So here's our user interface. We see all of our guys, uh, Martha, Mike, Scott, and Sue sorted. 
if I delete Mike, boom, he's gone. Delete Sue, gone, and so on. So, so far, so good. This is where we start getting into that notification for the users. Because right now, if the user taps those, there's no double checking. That person is gone. There's no way to get it back. There's no verification. What we'd like to do is just double check, hey, was that okay to delete that? So to start with, we're gonna do this using a dialog. And to set up this alert dialog, I'm gonna put it inside of, yeah, let's do it at the UE level up here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a little uh, alert dialog that's gonna pop up on top of the entire UE at this level. To do that, I'm gonna need some kind of variable to keep track of, should we display the dialog or not? And you could use a Boolean for that, or you could use something that's actually holding on to some data. Now, in this case, I need to be able to t tell the user, hey, do you really want to delete Scott? Do you want to delete Martha? And so on. So I'm going to keep track of a variable that keeps track of who we're deleting. Uh, I also need the ID of that person to delete. So we're going to create a couple little remembers here to keep track of those two pieces of information. But it's really super important that we keep track of this information across configuration changes. So what we're going to need to do is make these remembers savable instead of just remember. Remember, we'll be able to calculate it every time you come in for your initial composition. Uh, remember savable, will reread that in. It keeps track of it over configuration changes. Um, you don't always need that. A lot of times you're just gonna be working on data that's passed in and compute things off of that. But every once in a while you wanna remember the state of something across a configuration change. Now, one of the things that's challenging there is when you say remember savable, the item has to be able to be saved. It has to be able to be marshaled into a binary form. And we don't have any support for doing that for person right now. We could, I don't wanna get into the details of that. So instead what I'm gonna do is just have these two separate remember savables for the person ID and the person name. Um, otherwise, if I made the person itself be able to be uh, saved off, which I'd have to make it parcelable, we'll talk about that another time, uh, then I could have just said remember savable on the person itself. So instead, we're just gonna have two objects. They're both gonna be strings. So I'm gonna say var person ID to delete, whoops, by remember savable, and I'm gonna say true here because I don't wanna have it recreated any time. I'm just gonna have a bucket to put this into. And then inside here, mutable state of nullable string starting off as null. Okay, and because this is a var, I'm gonna to need to do that extra import for the set value. I just did my alt enter. And then I'm gonna say person name to delete as well, which is gonna be the same kind of thing. So this is gonna keep track of those two for us across configuration changes. So uh, when we have that dialog up, we want the dialog to still stay up and we want the same data to appear in that dialog. So now before we actually call our person UE, let's do our dialog. And we could put this in a separate function. For, um, right now I'm just gonna go ahead and put it inside here. So I'm gonna say person ID to delete, let, and I'm just gonna say person there. And this block is gonna be triggered if I have any type of person to delete. So here's where I wanna create my alert dialog. And the first thing we're gonna handle is a dismiss request. So if somebody asks to dismiss it, is there any cleanup we need to do? Is there anything in particular we need to, to change? And the thing we need to change here is this person ID to delete variable. So we just need to null it out so the dialog will go away. Otherwise the dialog won't go away. If I leave it like this and the user taps outside the dialog, nothing's gonna happen. So I'm gonna say person ID to delete equals null, just like that. And that's our first thing there. Uh, now let's actually talk about what the dialogue is going to look like on the screen. We're going to have a title. We're going to have some kind of a message inside of it. We're going to have buttons. So let's start with our title. And this guy is again going to be a Lambda that's going to have a text inside of it. So let's just say text, text equals delete person, question mark. And then let's have a text section. This is going to be our message. And we're going to say, do you really want to delete dollar person, oops, dot name. 
Oh, that's because that's a person ID there. So I'm going to say um, person name to delete. There we go. So that's going to be a little text that appears on the screen. Now, just a little note, if you wanted to, you could also put other controls inside here, because this is just a composable. It's going to emit things to that tree to represent what's on the screen. So you could have a slider. You could have an entry field. You could have other stuff inside here as well. Um, in some cases, it's easier to just use a base dialog, because the alert dialog has some extra functionality that makes assumptions about what buttons should be present, you know, what order they should appear, things like that. So if you want more customization, just go with a raw dialog. I'm going to add in here a confirm button and a dismiss button. And I think there's also a neutral button. I can't remember. Uh, those are the two main ones, but there's also a separate uh, version of this dialog that can take a buttons function and you can put anything you want inside there. One thing that's nice about using this version instead of the raw buttons one is you don't have to worry about the layout of those buttons. The, the alert dialog takes care of that. And the alert dialog is always going to put the dismiss button to the start side of the row of buttons. And the confirm button is going to be to the end side. So confirm button to the right, dismiss button to the left. And the reason that they came down with that in the uh, material design guidelines is because they kind of have a feel of a previous and next to them. So the previous for dismissing would be the one that's on the left side. Next for actually continue would be on the right side. So that's really kind of the reasoning behind those. Uh, so I want to have a uh, button. I'm going to create a little helper function here for that. My button. And he's going to have some text. and a um, on click and we'll say he's going to be a button on click is on click and then inside there we'll have some text with a text equals text kind of like that so it's just going to shorten up what we need to do for our button and i'll come down into here and i'm going to say it's going to be a my button where the text is uh, say delete and this is something you're going to want to talk with your user interface designer about um, do you want to use okay cancel or more uh, concrete uh, verbs um, the the group that i used to work with uh, at the, my past company, we were really into the concrete verbs. So you'd see delete and cancel as opposed to okay, cancel, or yes, no. Um, some questions, you know, this one could be answered with a yes, no, but being a little more explicit with the word delete and the word cancel, the use, a lot of users, they really aren't going to read this very well. So having on the buttons, the base idea of what those buttons mean, sometimes is going to be more helpful for the users, you know, especially if they read or misread or didn't read that message. So when we delete, then I want to actually delete the item. So this is where we're going to say view model delete person ID, just like that. And this is actually why I used the ID in that delete function was because I knew this was coming where I was just going to have the person ID and I wouldn't have a whole person. Otherwise, I'd have to go look the person up so I could delete it. The dismiss button, pretty simple. Inside here, he's going to say person ID to delete equals null. Boom, just get rid of that. Now, a little bit of a heads up here. When the confirm button is pressed, if I leave it like this, the dialog is going to stay up because I didn't tell it to remove the dialog. And this is actually nice because there are going to be times when you want to actually allow the user to do an action multiple times inside of a, a dialog. And you know you might have a, you know, think about a find dialog where you type in the text for a find and you keep pushing that find button over and over and over again. And then you have a done button to get out of there or a close button. So that might be an example of that. In this particular case, we do want to have that uh, person to delete be actually deleted. Now, what I've written here so far, these guys are going to be run in the user interface thread. So we probably want to launch those 
into another coroutine or make sure that this guy launches into a coroutine. Oops. Um, yeah, actually, that needs to be there. Let's do, let's do the uh, dismiss when we're dismissing and not when we're creating the confirm button. That would be helpful. Um, so in a case like this, you know, we may want to have this action in the view model start off view model scope dot launch on dispatchers.io, something kind of like that, and then do the action. Now, in this case, it really didn't matter that much because we're just doing in-memory data, but we should try to get in this habit of anytime we're modifying data, we kick it off on a background thread so we're never tying up the user interface thread. I'm not going to consistently do this through these examples, uh, but I wanted to bring that up here. And we should, of course, do the same thing in add, add person, that type of stuff. So that's our delete. He's going to actually delete the, uh, the ask to delete the person. Hopefully we'll see that show up in the, the uh, uh, hopefully we'll see that actually show up on the user interface. So now we actually need to just set these guys so that we'll trigger displaying this. So instead of down here directly doing the delete, we're going to indirectly do it. We're going to say person name to delete equals it dot name and person ID to delete equals it dot ID. And so that will end up forcing the dialog to get up there. Now I did actually do this in this order for a reason here. We're going to set the person name to delete, which doesn't trigger any type of user interface update and whoops, and then set the ID, which will trigger having that dialog and the first time the dialog is displayed, it'll have the right person name. So it won't show the previous person's name before it gets here. So that'll set those guys up. Now what you could do to also be a little bit more clean here is add in a person name to delete equals null as well. And that wouldn't be a bad idea just to keep that clean so that when the dialog comes up, regardless of which order you set those, you're not gonna see the previous name. You may see the the an, an empty name for a moment though so we really should take a look at this guy here let's be a little cleaner on him and i will say person name to delete let oops, something kind of like that and we'll put an it here. So what this is gonna do is this is gonna make sure I only display that piece of text if there's actually a person name to delete. So if we didn't have the timing right, you wouldn't see do you really wanna delete null, which would be kind of awkward. Okay, so that should do it, I believe. Let's go ahead and try running this and see if our confirmation works. So let's go ahead and try deleting somebody. And whoops. Ah, uh, la 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 la, what did I do? So you can see the dialogue's coming up, but it's getting dismissed right away. So let's take a look at the code in there and see if something looks fishy. Oh, it's the dismiss button. Um, so this is actually what I was talking about when I said this shouldn't be outside of the button. When I'm actually creating that, I'm immediately setting these during the composition, which ends up clearing the dialog instantly. So I actually need another, another button down here, which kind of makes sense, huh? And so this one's going to be cancel. There we go. Now we should be okay. So instead of setting those flags during the composition step, we're going to emit a button during that composition step. Now it should be, be more comfortable. Glad that happened. So I clicked on Mike. Do you really want to delete Mike? I'm going to say cancel and nothing changes. If instead I hit delete, Mike disappears from the list. Ta-da! Very nice. So this is one way that you can engage with the user to have a double check. And this would actually be a good spot for a double check because it would be really, really easy to accidentally hit these buttons. Now, if you expect them to delete a lot, 
if, you, if you're expecting this action a lot, then a confirmation dialog is probably not a good way because it's like, I'm going to delete Martha. Oh, another delete box. Delete Scott. Oh, another delete. They're going to have, they're going to get a little annoyed with that. So this might be a case where having a, a snack bar would be a better choice to do things. So let's make a copy of that main activity. I call it main activity two. And before I forget, I'm going to change it to main activity two in my, oh, I didn't change it in the actual class there. Actually, I'm gonna get rid of this my button and just let it keep using the other my button. I have UE2 and Let's see, the people UE, I think the people UE is going to be the same. So let me go ahead and delete that and just let it use the other people UE. And this guy is going to end up being changed. Okay, so far so good. So inside this one, what we want to do is be able to display a snack bar. And a snack bar has a few different pieces of data associated with it. He has something called a snack bar host, which is an area that's going to display the snack bar or not. He has a snack bar state, which determines what's going to be visible inside there. And then he has the actual snack bar component. And so what we're going to need to do is deal with that snack bar host. And we can put it in manually by ourselves, but it's actually handled by the scaffold for us. So if we put a scaffold into this application, we can use its support to trigger the snack bar. So I'm going to come down to our UE. And what I want to do is around my people UE, I want to put my scaffold. And so we're going to have a content equals, I'll put the people UE up inside there. I'm going to have a top bar and let's put inside the top bar. And the, the way that we're going to have to do this is we need to tell the scaffold to display uh, the, the snack bar. And there's really no scaffold to talk to. The scaffold is a function. So that means we're going to have to change the state coming into the scaffold. And the scaffold has something called, surprise, surprise, scaffold state. And uh, so what I want to do is create a scaffold state explicitly and then pass it into the scaffold. And then if I change something inside the scaffold state, the scaffold can refresh itself. So I'm going to come up here and say val scaffold state equals remember scaffold state, just like that. And so that gives me that and I can pass him in like that. Now, scaffold state is going to be a stable piece of data as opposed to an immutable piece of data. So inside of scaffold state, he has uh, some uh, uh, um, compose mutable state, which can be observed. So if we take a look at scaffold state, we're going to see that he's marked as stable. And then inside there, we have this snack bar host state. When we look at him, we're going to see that we have a mutable state of with a private set. This, because it's a mutable guy inside of that stable object, mutable state is something that Compose can listen to. So this is okay for a stable object. And this one, of course, is marked stable as well. Anything marked stable is something that composable functions can listen to to see if they need to recompose. So what we're going to do with this guy is let's go to, let's see, when we have our top bar, I'm going to go ahead and say top app bar and pass in a title for him. Let's have a sample application there. And what is he unhappy? Oh, He's unhappy because that's actually supposed to be a composable function. So we'll say text text equals, just like that, like we always do. That's much better. And now when we're actually doing our people UE here, we have our on delete is going to be a little different. So instead of triggering this function to come up, triggering this uh, 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 the dialog to come up, I want it to trigger the snack bar to come up. So 
Let me just double check. I did this in here, right? Yeah, okay. I'm going to go ahead and delete all this wonderful dialogue from number two. And then when we're deleting, we want to tweak that snack bar host state. Now, once again, we're going to be doing things in the background here. Uh, so what I want to do is to kick off a coroutine. And this coroutine is the thing that's going to listen for the user to do its, uh, uh, to click the action or not, as well as time out the snack bar. So I'm going to come in here and, well, we need a scope to do that. Let's say val scope equals remember coroutine scope. And inside here, I can say scope.launch. And I can put that on dispatchers.default because we're not directly modifying any type of data using IO here. We're just going to change some state. And so I'm going to say scaffold state. That's the overall state for the scaffold. I'm going to get the snack bar host state from it. And then I'm going to say show snack bar. And let's see, there's parameters to that guy. Message is going to be person.name. Actually, where's the person? Put them up here. There we go. Person.name deleted. And I want to possibly have some kind of action there. So I'm going to say action label. It's going to be undo. And we're not going to do anything with it to start with. We're just going to see it display this guy, uh, and um, hopefully things will work there. Uh, oh, and actually, we want to call the delete as well. So we'll say view model delete person dot ID, just kind of like that. Now, in this case, I probably should have this delete be a suspend function, so it takes part of uh, it takes uh, part of the this um, uh, this particular coroutine. So let me actually go tweak that. So this delete, instead of doing a view model scope launch, I'm gonna make him a suspend fun. And uh, actually let's do this. Let's have a suspend fun um, delete person. Uh, yeah, we'll do it this way. I'm going to say delete async up here because we're going to kick off a coroutine in that case. This one here is actually going to take part in another coroutine. And this one I may want to say with context dispatchers.io. Okay, yeah, I think I like that better, which means I'm going to have to come back here and tweak this a little bit. So because um, because at this point we're not inside of a coroutine, I want to kick one off. So I'm going to call that delete person async, which is going to kick off a coroutine. And in the main activity two, actually, was there something in there that wasn't happy? Oh, no, it's just pink. Uh, and then in this one here, this delete person is going to take part in this other coroutine. So we're going to first do this, then do this. Otherwise, the way I had it written, it would kick off a job to do the delete and then immediately jump to this while that other job's running. So that, you know, we're going to say person deleted and they may not have actually been deleted yet. So just trying to get this so that it's, it's really legit describing what happened. Okay, so this is all good there. Um, the thing that's actually more important there is that if I didn't do it this way, this job could still be running potentially when the user hits undo. And then that behavior is going to be a little non-deterministic. We could do the undo before the do happened. This case, the way I've written it now, because this is a suspend function and it's part of the same coroutine, there's no way I can get that order wrong. So don't have my undo supported yet, but let's see how this ends up looking. And I'm going to go ahead and run this. And there's our application. When I click this now, notice that it says Martha deleted with an undo that I could interact with, and then it eventually goes away. Scott deleted, and then an undo, and it'll eventually go away. Now, 
One thing that's a little tricky with this is if I hit both of these really fast, the, we still have to wait for the timeout unless we explicitly delete it. So if I go Mike and then Sue, notice that it's it's not uh, putting the Sue deleted until uh, uh, the mic was actually gone away. So let's fix that up a little bit. I want to explicitly delete it if uh, the um, the user went a little too fast there. So I'm going to come in here and say scaffold state dot snack bar host state dot uh, current snack bar data. And current snack bar data keeps track of the snack bar that's currently displayed. It might be null. So what I want to do is say, if it's not null, dismiss it. So if there's one in progress, dismiss the existing one so that we can then see the next one immediately. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. And if I go bang, 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 we'll notice that we're immediately seeing the last one we did. Uh, now, of course, with this approach, I can only ever delete or undelete the last one that was deleted. So let's see how we actually manage that. When we do a show snack bar, we're going to get a, an object that's going to tell us what the result was at some point. And we'll wait until that result's available before we can actually use it. So I can just say val result equals, and that's the snack bar result object. That's going to show the snack bar. And once the user has actually done something with it, we can actually look at it. I can say when result, which will actually wait for the result inside this coroutine. I'm going to say snack bar result. If it's dismissed, I've got nothing to do because the user dismissed it. They didn't say they want to undo it or the snack bar just went away by itself and there's nothing for it to do. Now, if I actually, if the user actually clicked on that action performed, then we want to do our undo. So inside here, I'm going to say view model dot add person with person dot ID, person dot name, whoops, and person dot age. And what I'd like to do is after that ad actually happened, I would like to report what ended up happening, that the person was undone. That's where we can get into using a toast because there's nothing to undo on that. We're just saying to the user, yep, I undid that. So to do a toast, I need to get a hold of the uh, context that I'm going to use in Android to get a hold of him. The context in this app, this uh, case is going to be the application. I'm uh, sorry, the, um, the activity. So I'm going to say up here, val context equals local context dot current. And that's going to always return whatever the current context is for where I am. So if I were doing this inside an activity like I am, the context is the activity. If I were doing it inside of a fragment, it would be the owning activity of that. And there's some other types of context we can work with, but those are the two most recent one, most common ones. Um, hopefully you'll never have to deal with a fragment. Fragments are a bit of a nightmare. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say toast dot make text passing in that context. And the context is used to be able to uh, get information about where it's going to go on the screen and things like that. Uh, and then the message we're going to say dollar person dot name restored. I think that's what I wanted to do there is say, yeah. And then I want to say how long that shows up on the screen. There's a couple context, uh, uh, um, constants I can use, length long or length short, or you can specify a number of milliseconds. Typically, you're going to use length long or length short. Now, the most common error people have with toasts is creating a text and not actually showing it on the screen. And that's what this warning is over here. If I float over it, it's going to say toast created but not shown. Did you forget to call show? Why, yes. Yes, I did. So I can put that show on there. And so that should tell us that the person has actually been undeleted. And this add should add our person back. So let's give this a try and see if it looks like it's doing the right thing. So I'm going to delete Mike. I'm just going to let it time out. 
and now I can't undo Mike. Mike is gone forever at this point. If I delete Scott and say, whoops, I didn't mean to undo, Scott came back. Oh, well, that's interesting. So what just happened there? So I'm passing in person ID, name, and age. Oh, I never actually uh, implemented that. Let's put this in here saying add person ID, name, age. Let's try that one more time. That was silly. Okay, so I'm going to delete Mike, then I'm going to delete Scott, and undo. Okay, something is going wrong. Oh, I know what's going wrong here. <laughs> um, so what ended up happening here, we're getting some kind of error, obviously. And we'd like to find out what that error is. Now, sometimes the Run tab will show you that. And in this case, you can see there's an exception coming up in here. If you're not seeing it in the Run tab, first thing I say is run, run it a second time, because sometimes it'll show up the second time. Otherwise, we're going to have to go to the logcat tab to see the entire log. And then scroll back until we see something that looks like an exception. And when you're looking for those exceptions, they can be particularly difficult to find on an actual device because there's usually a lot more happening. But the exceptions are going to show up as red. So we're going to look for something red. But you also want to look for ones that have a blue link inside of them. The blue link is an indicator to tell you that that's code inside your project. So that's usually going to be the, the one that we're caring about here. Um, in this case, it showed up on the Run tab, so we could have done it there. But just in case, I want to show you where you can look. So in this case, it says, can't toast on a thread that has not called looper.prepare. Huh. What does that mean? Well. In this case, it's just saying you can't toast when you're not on the user interface thread. So we need to kick back to the user interface thread to actually do the toast. So I'm going to go back to my main activity where this one is showing the error. And let's minimize that. And here's our toast here. We're just going to switch context. I'm going to say which with context dispatchers.main. So we're going back over to the user interface thread to do our actual toast. And this is the wonderful thing about coroutines is you can switch back and forth between which thread you want to run things on whenever. And they perform super, super well. Okay, so we're going to delete Mike. I'll delete Scott. I will undo Scott. And there, Scott's back. And the little message popped up here saying Scott restored. And then that toast goes away. And you can't interact with that toast there. So this is one way you can handle that undo. And this is going to be for isolated cases. If you don't want to have a big amount of things in your application handled, or you just don't want to deal with the command pattern, you can do this and you'll see that we're basically just keeping track of the person who was deleted right here. He captures it inside that Lambda as a parameter. And so that person is available here to redo just by being inside that delete Lambda. Uh, and that'll work here, but you'll also notice we can only ever undo the last thing we did. We can't undo anything more. If you want to be able to undo more, you're really going to have to look into having an undo framework. So let's take a look at what that looks like. I'm going to make a... I got the sun coming in and stabbing me in the eyes right now, sorry. Uh, I'm going to make an activity three. And then again, before I forget, change it in here. I wish I would remember that more often. And we'll make this be main activity three and UE three. And then let's see what's going to be happening inside here. Let's go to our view model. And what I'd like to do in a view model is set this up so that we can um, uh, undo things and keep track of what's, or execute things, keep track of what was, was executed, undo those, and then redo them. So to do this, we're going to need a little bit of support for dealing with uh, do and undo and things like that. So I'm going to first of all create the concept of a command. And I'm going to define this as an interface. 
and he's going to have three functions in him. Execute, undo, and redo. So really simple concept of, a, of an interface here. And we can use this anywhere in our application. We could have a separate undo manager. We can do it inside our view model. If we had multiple view models, they can do this. Um, if you have multiple view models, you'll definitely want to have a separate undo manager class. Um, you know, why don't we do that? Let's just, let's go ahead and have a separate undo manager. And he's going to be a class by himself. And he needs to keep track of the stacks, the undo stack and the redo stack. So I'm going to say private var undo stack. And he's going to be an empty list of commands. And we're going to do the same kind of thing with a, actually, it's, yeah, we'll do the same kind of thing with a redo stack. Keep track of commands. And then we're going to have some functions in here. So fun execute, taking a command, and then a fun undo, and a fun redo. And let's think about what all these have to do. So whenever we are executing something, we're going to actually execute the command. So we say command.execute. And then we have to push it on the undo stack. So we're going to say undo stack equals undo stack plus command. Boom, we've pushed it on the stack. Fairly simple. Let's think about what an undo is going to do. Undo is going to say, let me pop off the undo stack and then push it on the redo stack. Well, pop it off, call redo, and then push it on, sorry, pop it off, call undo, and then push it on the redo stack. So let's first of all say here if undo stack is not empty. If it is empty, we're just going to completely ignore the undo request because there's nothing to be undone. Um, then I'm going to say undo stack. Well, actually, I want to do this a little differently. The, the problem is if I do this, undo stack dot last, this creates a race condition. If between these two lines, something got put into the undo stack or between these two lines, the undo stack got cleared, this guy is going to fail. So what I'm gonna do is use last or null. So say undo stack, last or null. And if I have one, I'm gonna call that to undo. And this way there's no way I can get that race condition because it tries to grab it. If there isn't one, I'm just gonna completely skip the let. If there is one, I'm going to capture it as to undo. And now I can use that. Okay. Now, the uh, the only thing here that we got to deal with is the undo stack itself is not atomic as far as operations are concerned. So we may want to have some kind of a lock on this guy to make sure that it, two things can't be pushing and popping at the same time for him. So we could say synchronized undo stack. And this would actually solve the previous problem as well. We wouldn't have to worry about doing it this way. We could have actually had the separate pop and then do something with it. Okay, so we have our undo stack last or null and to undo, we're gonna first of all say undo stack equals undo stack drop last one. So we're gonna get rid of that last item from the stack itself. Then we can say to undo undo it. And then we're going to say redo stack equals redo stack plus to undo. Something kind of like that. Now, of course, that means we need to lock the redo stack as well. You have to be really careful here because we could set ourselves up for a deadlock if we're, if we're really uh, not careful. Um, so instead of synchronizing on undo stack and then saying inside here, synchronized on redo stack, let's say that we did this for a second. And let's talk about why this would be bad. If I did the same logic down here in my redo, but reversed it, so that's gonna be redo, that's gonna be redo, 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 and we'll call this to redo. And then these all become undo. 
Let's say that we did it this way. Think about what's going to happen. If some if one thread came in here and got that far, and another thread comes in here at the same time and gets that far, we've now got ourselves a deadlock because up here I'm waiting for the redo stack to be available, and down here I'm waiting for the undo stack, and we've locked each other's. So instead of doing that, I want to have a separate lock object that just keeps track of I'm doing some stack operation. I don't care which one I'm working on. I'm just going to lock everything for doing stack operations. So uh, we could do that with any old object we want here. I could say something kind of like private val uh, lock equals any. And this is just going to create a dummy object that I can lock on and then just change all these synchronized like that. And then here. I can do something kind of like that. Boom. And so now I can't accidentally get deadlocked and I'm making sure that you can only do an undo or a redo at the same time by doing this. So, and you can also use other types of lock support on there. You have to be careful because some of them have counters in them and they aren't, and it's not just for different threads. It's for um, any type of step into the function and you have to watch out for those. So inside of here, we have our undo and our redo. So our undo stack, grab the guy, remove it from the undo stack, call undo, put it on the redo stack. In the redo, we pop off the redo stack. This one I need to change to redo. Glad I was reading through that again. And then call undo stack, undo stack plus redo. So boom. Now, one thing I'd also like to do with this object is I'd like to expose the status of if there's anything available to be undone or available to be redone so that we can appropriately put buttons on the user interface that are made enable or not. So to do that, I'm going to put in a var undo available by mutable state of false. And I'll do the same kind of thing for redo available. And these are just going to be a couple states that the user interface can listen to, to be able to uh, determine if it should be undoing or redoing. And let's see. Yeah, so what I'm going to do now is Anytime these guys change, I want to update, un, update undo available or redo available. So inside here, I'm going to say, give me a setter. And then I can first of all say field equals value. So I'm actually setting the backing field for this like I need to. And then I can say undo available equals undo stack is not empty. And I can do the same thing for the redo. Actually, let's say value, just so we don't have to actually call the getter again. We're just going to get the value that was passed in for our setter. So then this will update those two fields, so I should be able to listen to those in the user interface. Now we're going to need to have this undo manager available inside our view model. Now if you had multiple view models for whatever reason, you know, maybe you want to have different parts of your application have different view models so that the data is a little more cohesive with it. Um, each of them could use the same undo manager. And that's a place where you're really going to want to look at using dependency injection so that you make sure the same undo manager is introduced to all of your view models. So I'm just going to go ahead and put him inside here. So let's say private val undo manager equals undo manager, just like that. So we'll create our instance of him. And then we're going to delegate those properties. So I'll say val undo available equals undo manager dot, oops, I'm sorry. Let's do this right. Undo manager dot undo available. Um, what I was just uh, questioning myself on there for a second, if I said val undo available equals undo manager dot undo available, I'm going to get the value once and then hold on to that value. In this case, I'm saying anytime somebody asks undo available, 
I'm going to return undo manager undo available. I think this is going to work. I'm getting a little questiony on whether, whoops, I need to actually have these guys be mutable states. I don't think I do. I think I'm okay. But let's see how it goes. This should actually work. So when the, when the user interface does its compose, if it asks for undo available, it's going to flow through to here, which is going to flow through to the mutable state. And then the snapshot manager is going to say, oh, somebody looked at that piece of data. When that goes back to the user interface, the user interface is going to say, oh, there's a snapshot involved there. I'm going to need to listen for that piece of data on, on changes. And if, if it needs to be uh, refreshed, I'm going to go back and get this value again. So that should work. Okay, so that'll expose those. Um, we're also going to have some function that's going to be exposed from the, uh, the view model for uh, um, being able to undo and redo and all that stuff. So I'm going to say fun undo equals undo manager dot undo. And we'll do the same thing with the redo, just pass him directly through. And for execute, I'm actually going to keep that internal. That's going to be something that actually happens inside based on some other function. So I'm going to execute with different types of um, different types of variables, uh, different types of uh, um, commands. So let's create a command to delete a person. I'm going to define an inner class. Actually, uh, yeah, inner call it inner class delete person. Who's going to take a person and let's actually make him private. And he's going to implement command. Now I made this an inner class because the functions inside here, the, the undo, the redo, and the execute are going to call other functions inside the view model. So in order to have visibility to their parent class, I need to make it an inner class. So I'm going to hit Alt Enter on him and say implement members. Pick all three of those, and there we go. So we have our commands inside there. So let's see what these have to do. So if we're doing an execute, I'm going to say delete person, passing in person.id. Now delete person is a suspend function. So inside here, if I'm executing this command, now I got to decide if I want to have the these guys be suspend functions or not. So delete person I made be actually I want to make him just be called delete person async. That's right. Okay, so now to undo, I want to undo the action that I was actually uh, performing before. So this is going to be an add person passing in a uh, person. Did I have a uh, Helper for that. Oh, I just called it add. So I'm just going to call it add, adding the person back in. Now, if I were worried about uh, other people keeping track of that same person object, a slightly safer way here would be to actually force it to create a brand new person. There we go. And that's an add person function now. We could do that. And then redo most of the time is going to be exactly the same as what the execute did. If there's something temporal involved, like maybe you have to keep track of at what time this action actually occurred, you might have to do something slightly different in redo. But most of the time, redo is just going to be a call to execute whenever you're doing the command pattern. Okay, so let's see how this might actually work. And... Let's add in a, instead of delete person <coughs> being uh, set up this way, let's do a, well, actually I want to do a delete person async. So I make a copy of him. I'm going to say with undo. So what this guy's going to do is instead of directly modifying that, I'm going to use the undo manager to do that for us. So I'm going to say undo manager dot execute delete person command. Uh, wait a minute. 
Oh, I didn't say command on that. Passing in the person. And whoops, this one needs a full on person and not just a person ID. So we will put them in there like that, which we should have access to because we're not doing the dialogue stuff here. We're just doing the uh, 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 handling it when the user clicks on the, the trash cans. If we did only have access to the person ID, we could go ahead and just look it back up in our map if we needed to. So this is gonna kick off a crow routine and do that execute for us. We could, because the execute isn't a um, uh, suspend function, we could do it. You know, I'm really kind of thinking I wanna do these as uh, suspend functions. I'm gonna hang, I'm gonna hang off on that for now, um, but this should be okay the way it's written. Um, we don't really need the coroutine launched here because this execute is going to launch the coroutine. So I'm going to go ahead and just delete that. There we go. So delete person async with undo. Well, see, now it's counting on the, uh, let's say delete person with undo. There we go. Uh, no, I want to call it async. I'm going to go ahead and put that back in just to be explicit that there's a coroutine being created. This is going to launch another coroutine under the covers. Um, we probably really should make the execute, undo, and redo be suspend functions. I will leave that as an exercise for the interested reader. Okay, so this function is now what we want to call instead of the other delete function. So in our main activity three, here's our delete person being called. And instead, I'm going to say delete person async with undo, passing in the person. And now I don't need to use the snack bar. I'm just going to directly use a toast to delete the person, to say the person was deleted. Something kind of like that. Now, we have a similar issue with the toast being able to be dismissed or canceled, I think is what they use here for this term. Uh, so what we could do is keep track of the toast and try canceling it in case the user is clicking pretty quickly on things. Uh, let's see if we can do that here. Um, I want to actually have it be outside of this. So we're going to say var current toast. It's going to be a toast equals null. And then I believe we can just say down here current toast dot cancel and then we say current toast equals that the only thing here is that show doesn't return the current toast the first one does so what we need to do is after we've created this guy we can call apply and then put the show call inside there so what this is going to do is it creates our toast passes it in to the apply function as the this parameter so it becomes a receiver to that apply function and then we can call show inside there but the nice thing about apply is that it actually returns that receiver so again think of it as an initialization we're creating it and initializing it by showing it that gives us a current toast that we can then cancel so i think that'll let us click on the toast pretty quickly so let's try running this And let's delete somebody. And there's the toast, Martha deleted. Let's try deleting Mike and Scott pretty quickly. Boom, boom. Oops, it, the, because he shifted up there, it got Sue where I was deleting. Um, but that seemed to be working pretty well. So now we need to expose that functionality for undoing and redoing. Because right now we don't have any type of widgets in the user interface to do it. I'm gonna put a little undo and redo icon up on the toolbar there. These guys are going to be in the extended icons. So I'm going to grab the extended icons. Dependency. Let's put them there. And this is something you don't want to deliver with the entire tool, the entire extended icons tool set in there. You want to pull out just the ones that you care about, which is going to be, or actually, are they in the normal one? No, I think, I think they're actually in, in the extended set. Um, let me just double check that before I do this. 
let's go back to our main activity three and let's just see if I can use icons dot default dot undo yeah so undo and redo aren't available they're only in the extended set okay so I was saying the right thing so let's go to our interface here and we're gonna to need to add that to the top bar so we're gonna add some actions in the top bar I'm gonna set these so that they're gonna be enabled or disabled based on if undo is available and redo is available so let's have a little a little helper function up here or down here and we'll say action button and that's going to have an icon which is an image vector might as well just call it image vector just to be consistent and we're going to have a content description which is a string and a action or on click so that's going to be an icon button with an on click being on click inside there we're going to have an icon with image vector equals image vector and content description equals content description so we can now put those inside this guy pretty easily we'll say actions and inside there uh, let's give it a action button oh I didn't pass in uh, enabled or not and so up here I should be able to say image vector equals icons dot default dot undo content description is undo and the action it's going to do is call view model dot undo and I can also pass in enabled view model dot undo available and let me go ahead and spread those out so it's a little bit more readable And then we'll do the same kind of thing for redo. Now there's a choice you have to make when you're doing buttons on the toolbar and the buttons are gonna be enabled versus actually just not appearing. Uh, depending on the context that you're doing and how often something's going to happen sometimes it's better to just leave the buttons always there but be disabled when they're not available versus just blinking in and out and having the the icons kind of seem to come and go or move around um, it's one of those things that you're really just gonna have to kind of play with um, in this particular one when i was playing with this earlier it looked really bad to have the undo and the redo buttons actually come and go because i originally had before each of these a if undo available do it if redo available do it and so the buttons would come and go and that was really jarring just trying to keep track of what's going on um, for other types of contexts it might make sense like when you select an item uh, in a list of things you might want to have different icons based on the type of thing you just clicked um, and they may not have any relation to each other in this particular case the undo and the redo come and go pretty quickly so having them uh, consistently there I think it's a little bit more uh, visually appealing so let's try this let's see if we get lucky <laughs> okay so now we see the grayed out undo and redo icons if I delete somebody undo becomes available now and if I click on it Scott comes back and the redo becomes available so now if I click on redo it goes back over to the undo boom now there's one other little thing that I forgot to put into here whenever you're executing it really creates a new point for uh, undoing things so um, if you were in the middle of kind of changing if you had a, if you have anything in your redo stack you want to clear your redo stack because that was a previous path forward and now we're taking a different path forward 
So redo doesn't really apply anymore. So we really need to make sure in our undo manager that whenever we do an execute, we say redo stack equals empty list. So we're just going to clear the redo stack, which will then say redo is not available anymore. Uh, let's see, why was that blinking? That was interesting. Uh, okay, so now let's try that one more time. Been a while since I've talked about undo and redo, so I forgot that point. That's a really good point to say. So if I came in and I said delete Sue and then delete Scott, and if I undid delete Scott, Sue is still on the undo stack. Scott is on the redo stack. If I now delete Martha, I don't want to have redo keep track of deleting Scott again because it wasn't in the same path that I'm going. So now when I delete Martha, we'll see that the redo gets cleared um, because otherwise redo would redo Scott in the wrong order. And that, that really would be something you didn't want to do. Um, so that's just a, a simple example of how undo and redo can be done. In this case, it's, it's much more powerful because now we have is unlimited undo, unlimited redo. And you have to be a little careful in what you do with these things, especially if you're uh, using commands to keep track of field edits, and even more especially if it's live field edits, like as somebody's typing characters in a field, if every single character gets another command, the user's not gonna wanna hit undo through every single one of those characters. So you're gonna have to get a little smarter about it and do a collapse on those commands. And uh, so a little bit more advanced feature on, command, on the undo pattern or the command pattern is being able to have some commands that if you see the same command in a row, you can combine them into a single command. So you'll pop the existing one off, take the new one, merge the result and put them on. So if the user typed A, it would have a remove character A. If the user types B, it would change to remove characters A, B. If the user types C, it would change it to remove A, B, C. Uh, and that creates a much, much nicer user interface. Um, that's only going to happen if you're really going hog wild on undo. And most of the time you don't. I do wish more applications had it. Uh, but most of the time, you know, you don't really need it all that often. For a case like this with deletes, it's generally a, a good idea to have. Okay, any questions on any of that? Okay, let's take a 10-minute break. It's 6.03. Let's start off at 6.13. Starting again here. <clears throat> Any questions on anything before we move forward? Okay, so the second topic of the night, speech. This is going to be for outputting speech and for recognizing speech. <clears throat> now, there's um, you can go both ways in this. You can generate speech from text or you can generate text from speech. And uh, a lot of times what we'll do is we we'll use the server to actually do the interpretation of what the user actually said. So you'll get a stream back of here's the text the user said. Um, you can install lo local recognition. It's sometimes a little bit burdensome. I think it's gotten better, but I haven't really tried much with it uh, recently. Um, for doing text-to-speech, what you're going to do is create a text-to-speech instance. And then after it's, re it's actually been initialized, the Lambda is going to run there. And that Lambda is actually going to do whatever you want after the initialization has been set up. So that's usually when what you want to do is tell it which language you want to do, other initialization, things like that, and set an on utterance progress listener. So this is going to be your callback to tell you what's going on with the text that's being spoken. You know, has it started? Is it going? Is it completed? Things like that. When you ask the text to speech instance to actually do some speaking, you have two main options on this. You can add to the existing thing to things to say, so you basically are creating a queue, or you can tell it completely skip what you're saying right now and start speaking fresh. So th that's the queue add or queue flush parameter on there. You're going to pass in a message, and then you're going to give it an ID so you can actually cancel that specific utterance if you want to. The basic speech to text, so when the user is actually saying something and you want to interpret what it is, uh, there's a couple different ways you can approach this. You can use an, a separate application on the device uh, by, call, by creating a new intent to recognize speech. 
in Android, when you create an intent for something, it's a description of something you'd like to do. And it's the system then figures out who can handle it. So somewhere on the system, there is a speech recognizer, and that's actually part of the system itself. And by submitting that intent, you're asking it to recognize speech for you. And one of the things that's nice about that is if you're using another application, you don't need your own permission for recording audio. That's handled by the other application. Um, so if it's part of the system, it can handle it for you. You have less to work with, less to worry about as far as doing permissions. Um, this will start that activity to recognize the text. Well, first of all, prompt the user to say something and then recognize the text. And then it'll send you back the results, including some confidence scores. In your manifest, you don't need any permissions. You just need to, to set up this queries thing, which allows you to go talk to the text-to-speech service. In order to, to do a, a speech directly, so rather than calling another activity, when you call the other activity, it's gonna have a prompt come up that's pretty obnoxious. Um, if you wanna handle it inside your application, then you need to deal with runtime permissions. Recording audio is considered a dangerous permission. Uh, that's because you know, you're picking up what the user's saying. They could say something sensitive. And so what we're gonna do here is use our own, actually, let's see, what is this one? Um, oh, I'm sorry, this is the actual, uh, this is still doing the, uh, the, the previous version. So here what we're doing is we're trying to set it up to uh, be able to make that request to get the speech. And you do that using this, this contract interface to create your intent and parse the result that comes back. This is a little bit simpler than the old way, which is what you would uh, say start activity passing an intent, and then you'd have to have a separate function called um, on activity result and figure out, well, what request was made. This handles all that behind the scenes for you, makes it you know, a little bit more encapsulated. So in this one, we're first of all creating an intent to describe what we wanna do. So in this case, the intent is that recognized speech, and we're putting a couple extra pieces of information in there. The language model, freeform in this case, you have a couple different language models. Freeform is one, um, what is it, it's called web or HTTP, which lets you speak in if you're communicating to a browser so you can uh, uh, use uh, uh, URLs via voice. Um, and then parse result gets the res responses back, that's this string array extra list from the intent. And we're gonna take a look at that. In this particular case, I'm saying, get the first item and lowercase it. If the user canceled, then we're gonna do something to handle the cancel. Otherwise, we're gonna handle some kind of error coming back. So this is the basic idea of using this other guy to do the, uh, the speech. Um, so to do this one, we're gonna set up something called a launcher, which we call register for activity result, passing in that get speech contract. And then what we wanna do when we get the response back. To launch it, we just say, use that launcher name dot launch, passing in true, boom. More golden. We need some kind of parameter passed into launch, which is why we have to pass in the true there. Now for automated speech to text, this will automatically listen to the user whenever we need to. And one thing you need to be careful of is you don't wanna have this just be on all the time because you're gonna chew up their battery. Uh, there's some applications where you might need that, like if you're doing a, a conversation translation, Google Translate's fantastic for that, where you can just constantly listen and translate on the fly. Um, but depending on what you're doing, you really don't want to be constantly listening because it can chew up the battery. Note that the speech recognizer can hear sound output from the device. So you want to make sure that you toggle back and forth between saying things and getting the user's response. So in order to do this, what we're going to need is, first of all, declare this permission, record audio, and that's a dangerous permission. So we're going to need to ask for runtime permission on that as well. And we're gonna to need to add in this query for the speech recognition service. Now this is different than the application we were talking to. This is actually just a service in the background that does the speech lookup for you. To use this guy, we're gonna call create speech recognizer. And inside of there, we're gonna set up a little listener for what to do when it hears something that the user said. So is it's ready for speech. This might be a place where you put a prompt on the screen. Um, when you've gotten some results back, and keep in mind those results could be in the middle of the user saying something. So you might get you know, chunks of results coming in over time. And then if there's an error, do something about it. We still need to set up a speech recognizer intent 
kind of like we did before, in order to pass it to the speech recognizer. This just describes, again, our model we're using and which language we're using. Note that this does require a runtime permission check. So in this particular case, I'm going to say start listening and stop listening for the basic stuff, but I need to wrap those in the appropriate permission checks to make sure the user is okay with me using their microphone. And I'm just going to double check on my phone here if I still have this installed. No, good. Um, I, I checked on my phone to see if it was installed already when I was testing before because uh, I want to make sure that the permission stuff comes up and I didn't just accept it. <clears throat> the example I'm going to use here is a little adventure game. It's, it's a text adventure game that we're going to allow the, the user to speak and then have it speak out stuff. <clears throat> Here's just a, a really super simple game with five rooms. It's got a key in a room, a safe in another room. You can use the key to unlock the safe and then get a letter out of the safe. There isn't any explicit check for you won the game, uh, but the, the win of the game would be reading the letter, which says you won. The basic game loop in here, we do text to speech to say what room we're in, and then we do speech to text for the user to enter their command. We parse those strings to figure out what that command means and then change the game state. Other rinse repeat. We just keep going over and over again. Now to do this for the parsing, we're going to use a tool called Antler. This is another tool for language recognition. And this is a text parser. So it's going to figure out what text means. And uh, I used to work for the guy who wrote this. Uh, his name's Terrence Parr. And he now works at Google, too. So it's like he, he pinged me the other day saying, hey, Scott, I just saw you worked here. Uh, it's small world. Very, very cool. Um, but uh, I'm a compiler guy at heart. I've, I've done a lot of different types of compiler and uh, static analysis work in the past. And I really enjoy this kind of work. Um, it's basically you're going to write a declaration of what your language looks like and what to do when you see certain parts of that language. And that's what we're going to do here. And Antler will take care of that for us very, very easily. You'll see that in a minute. The basic idea is we're, we're separating our parsing into two phases. The first phase is called lexing uh, or syntax analysis. Uh, and the second one is semantic analysis or parsing. Uh, so we're going to figure out what the letters mean. So we have this stream of letters coming in, G-E-T space L-E-T-T-E-R space. And the lexer will group those into what we call tokens. So we're going to take the get and the letter, put those together, throw away the space. The parser is then going to see these tokens and say, well, based on this grouping of tokens, that means something. And so then I'm going to go ahead and uh, evaluate it. Here's a little snippet of what that part of that grammar looks like. And this is in Antler 4 syntax. Um, we'll see that a command is one of these things, get, look, or go. There's other ones in the actual grammar, but that's you know some basic stuff here. And at the bottom, we have our lexer rules. Lexer rules start in uppercase. Parser rules start in lowercase. So the uppercase ones, we define a white space as being a space, a tab, or a form feed. And then we just tell that the parser, skip it. We don't need those. But it serves as a break between other tokens. A letter, a fragment rule here, we're never going to return a letter by itself. It's just saying, let me define what a letter is for convenience. Is lowercase a to z or uppercase a to z? And then a word is one or more letters. So we're using this uh, uh, BNF syntax here to specify how we want to actually uh, represent our rules. So then once we have words, we can use those words in our grammar here. And each of these little quoted things, get from, look, go, and so on, become constant words in our language. So if we say get and some word, or get some word from another word, we're going to perform some actions. So if I just said get word, notice how this branch down here doesn't have uh, the from in it. So we're just going to call game get, passing in the text of the word. If we say get something from something, we're going to call game get from, passing in those two options. Now you'll notice that this is Java syntax that I'm using here because the at, at the time I wrote this, there wasn't any Kotlin support in Antler. There is some Kotlin support now, I just haven't used it yet. Look is just going to call game look, go west, east, north, or south. They're going to call the appropriate go, passing in a constant to say which direction. So this is really all the parser is. And when we see the real parser in the in the game, you're going to notice that, hey, it's actually pretty simple. And uh, 
there's not a whole lot happening there. Um, it's doing a ton of stuff behind the scenes to make your life easier. Okay, so that's all of that. Let's take a look at an example here. And I'm not going to actually type this example. I'm going to just kind of walk you through parts of it here. Let's start. I've got a couple different modules in here. I've got an app module and a language module. And let's take a look in the language module first. This is just a Java library that's being produced. So if we take a look inside of this guy, I've got some Kotlin classes that I'm using. I can use those intermixed with Java as much as I want to. And then I've got this commands grammar that's going to generate uh, some Java code for me. Let's take a look at the uh, objects here. We have a data object, this or this data file here, which has my actual, um, oh, everything's hard coded, I forgot. I thought I was reading these from files. I used to read them from files, but uh, I guess I just kind of hardwired these in here with uh, Kotlin now. Um, let's go to data types first. So inside of this, we have stuff called things. These are either going to be containers or they'll be items, things like that. Um, if it's named, it has a name. It's a thing that's named and it has a description and a full description. Uh, if it's a uh, item, it's just a named thing. If it's a movable item, it's a named thing. And inside of here, a container is a named thing that can contain other items. So these are just some, some helper definitions here just to hold on to stuff while we're playing the game, while we're describing the game. And we'll see down here that we have a container item impl, we have a room, and so on. And each of these objects has functions you can do with them. So the room can contain some items. It may have other rooms to the north, south, east, or west. And when we're at, we can ask it to say, where can I go? And it'll generate a little string saying, you can go this direction, that direction, and so on. Um, the full description includes the description of it, where you can go, and what items are present. So there's a you know some helper functions inside here that let you uh, work with these objects more naturally. When you have something that is like a container item, maybe it's locked, maybe it's open, maybe there's a specific key for it. And you have functions in here that we're going to call from the game to do things like what happens when I open it? If it's already open, say it's already open. If it's locked, say it's locked. Otherwise, open it. So there's a little bit of logic here that changes the state of these objects based on the commands that have been given to it. This data is just setting up the game itself. It's a really small game, so not a lot of data in it. And then the game itself fairly small class here that's going to be our interface between the grammar and the objects. So we'll see inside here when we say game drop passing in an item name, then we're going to uh, take a look in here to make sure that the item is visible and then tell them that you dropped it. And this is this move function just going to try to move it from one space to another. So we're going to move it from our inventory. Uh, move, we're going to get this item move it from our inventory to the current room. So if you uh, want to know more information about how the game works, you can look at this. Um, basically, it's just doing the, the grunt work behind the scenes. Now, the grammar, and this is the part that kind of interests me the most, notice how there's almost nothing in this file. This is the one that has that entire language. So you can ask the different commands. Once we've spoken, it runs through the parser to figure out what the command is and then actually executes it. So pretty small uh, grammar here. And this module here is a Java library. So it's just going to create a jar containing the data types and the parser itself. We can then reference that inside of our application. So we come up to our application here. This guy references him by saying implementation project. So now I'm going to have all the language stuff available inside of this um, uh, the application module here. <clears throat> so let's see, anything interesting in here we want to talk about. So a little simple uh, way to present text on the screen. I created a helper for that. I have a recognition listener, so I can just override certain functions here, basically like when I get results back. I have a 
microphone image vector. Oh, that's something I wanted to show you with the, let me actually open back up. Um, was it this one? I think it was that guy. Oh, I moved him. Um, well, what I did is I ended up um, inside here, I included my material icons extended. And let me actually delete that. And inside of the activity, I think it's the second one actually. Yeah, so inside this activity, I wanna use the microphone icon. So I did a control space on him, brought him in. And then if I control click on Mike, it's gonna actually take me to the code definition of that guy. And so what I did is I did a control A to copy it or control A to select all, control C to copy. I created a little file that I called Mike and I just pasted it in. Now I needed to change my package here just so it matches the structure inside of here, but I'm keeping the copyright notice from the Android open source project. Once I've got this copied in, I no longer need to import it into, uh, or I no longer need to bring the dependency in. So I'm going to comment that out or delete him. And then I'm actually gonna need to tweak the code in uh, activity too, because Mike went from someplace else. Um, Oh, he's in the, he's actually in the same package. So now it's able to see Mike and he's the only icon that I brought in there. Uh, that way I'm not bringing in the entire batch of all the external icons, which is kind of heavy. Um, this little parse uh, uh, class here takes care of the, how do I deal with antler? How am I interacting with antler? So I just kind of separated that out as much as I could. And I have this parse function, where I'm gonna say game.parse, he's an extension function on game, where he's setting up the input stream, the lexer and the parser, and then saying, let's take the command that we're trying to parse, run it, and then it's gonna do something. So we're passing in the game object. He's gonna use that game object to figure out what to do. So we create a new instance of the parser each time, and poof, it creates our stuff. And this is just a little error listener on the end here. Now the activities, this first one, I don't do any type of speech in. This is just doing the user typing in some text. So this one's actually pretty lightweight. What he's gonna do is we create a game object and he has a little reporter in there that just spits the text out. So he's gonna update the text on the screen. We're gonna use that reporter function to uh, uh, be able to speak the text out later on. We're gonna call look up front so that we tell the user where they are. And then we have our little user interface here. So we'll see the user interface here. Every time the command, the command is entered, we're gonna call parse in command, which is gonna change the game state. And then we get that updated. Our UE just has a top app bar, a text field at the top, and then some status text underneath it. So let's see what this looks like. I'm actually gonna run this on my phone. Uh, because I, I'm still trying to figure out if there's a way I can get it to record the audio from the emulator. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold, turn my volume on the phone up, and hold it up to my face when the when I'm doing the uh, or hold up to my microphone when I'm uh, actually running it. Um, let's actually sync that one more time, and it's set up for my Pixel Six. Um, me bring up, there's a tool called Screen Copy, S-C-R-C-P-Y, that will let me mirror my phone, so you're seeing my phone here. Hopefully I won't get any uh, sensitive text coming through. Um, and what I'm going to do is run it on my Pixel 6 Pro. Okay, so now we see here's our adventure game. Location is the porch, command look, this is the front of your house, you can go north. So I can come in here and say go north. And then I'm gonna hit enter on him. Hall, go north, this is the, the main uh, hall of your house. You can go north, south, east, west. If I say go west, this is a room you never use and aren't really certain why you have it. You can go east and you see a key. So I could say get key. 
you picked up the key. And then I can go east and so on. And so this will let me move around the game, pick up objects and things like that. So this is just the basic text version of this adventure game. If I go in and let me comment out the first one in my manifest so that the main one to run is going to be main activity two, this one is going to speak out the, uh, the text. So let's take a look at the code behind him. You see there's a little bit more code in here now. And the main thing that I'm doing is adding in this text-to-speech instance. And the text-to-speech instance is going to be the thing that's going to take some text and speak it out. So we need to create this register for activity result with the contract, like we said, so that I can use this to launch the speech, uh, uh, the speech processor. And this is an external speech process uh, speech processor for recognizing speech so this one will speak it out but then i have to actually trigger it by hitting a little microphone icon uh, inside here i'm creating my text to speech instance and telling it Shh, i'm speaking when it's done no more status if there's an error i say there's an error whoops yeah that's actually okay create my game instance like i did before but note that the reporter now says text to speech speak. So it's going to put the text on the screen, but it's also going to speak it out. We're doing a Q add so that if it's already saying something, it just gets added to what's being said. Then we're setting up our game here. We added in an on microphone tap, which is a function uh, passed into the UE here. So when somebody taps on that microphone, we're going to try to recognize their speech. So it's going to go off to this other application. The user can t say something and then it'll return what the user said. And anything else interesting in here? So in my outline text field, I just put this trailing icon in there, which is that little microphone. Down here, here's our get speech contract like we saw before. We've got a sealed interface representing what ended up happening out of it. Did we actually get a result? Was it canceled and so on? So if we actually got a command back, it has the text inside of it. If we have speech canceled or error, they're just objects telling us what happened. So let's try running this one. And this is the front porch of your house. You can go north. Hopefully you heard that. Uh, and so now I'm gonna hit the microphone Go north. This is the main hall of your house. You can go north, south, east, west. So you can see that when I hit the microphone, it went off to that other application, which showed the uh, the little dialogue popping up. So watch when I hit the microphone. Go east. This is where you sleep. You can go west. And so it speaks out what's going on after that. Let's uh, go go west. This is the main hall of your house. You can go north, south, east, west. Go west. This is a room you never use and aren't really certain why you even have it. You can go east, you see a key. So by doing this, that having that icon on there, we're triggering going off to the other application to do the speech recognition for us. And the first time that somebody goes into that other application, which was a long time ago on this phone, uh, it prompts for, is it okay to record audio? So that's why we're not seeing the permission being asked at that point. Uh, so this is now letting us speak to the application, but I still got some interaction and they're hitting that microphone. I want to change it up so that it's going to use internal in the application speech recognition so it feels more uh, uh, cohesive. So let's take a look at application three. I'm going to go ahead and comment this guy out here. So activity three, we now have a speech recognizer that we're going to keep track of. We still need to define this intent to say to give the parameters for you know which speech I'm recognizing, if it's a freeform model or a World Wide Web model, that type of thing. Um, create text to speech like I did before. Still keep putting out the speaking when that happens, um, but. This try to start speech recognition is the thing that's actually going to try to get information. And what he's going to do is he's going to check, do I already have audio permission? If so, or if I don't, then I'm going to have to put up a little dialogue here saying, hey, I'm using voice commands. Please allow recording. And when the user hits OK, we're going to use that launcher 
to go get the recording permission. So here's the little launcher. Register for activity result with a permission request. If it's granted, start listening. Otherwise, tell the user, hey, you, know, you can't run this application without it. Our start listening is going to actually do the listening loop here. So we're going to kick off a little coroutine here. We're going to uh, use our speech recognizer to be able to, to figure out what the user said. And then we're going to use that parse that was set up to use Antler to figure out what the user means. And that's pretty much it in there. So not a whole lot of code. I mean, you see 177 lines of code to do this. Um, and a good chunk of it is just dealing with permissions and things like that. So let's try running this. I'm going to, again, hold this thing back up to my face, and hopefully you'll be able to hear everything OK. This is the front porch of your house. You can go north. OK, at this point, it's asking me for permission. Is it OK? to use this permission. So I'm going to hit OK on the little explanation dialog that I created. And then on the real permissions dialog, I'm going to say, as long as I'm using the app, go ahead and record audio. Go north. This is the main hall of your house. You can go north, south, east, west. Go west. This is a room you never use and aren't really certain why you even have it. You can go east. You see a key. Get key. You picked up the key. Go east. This is the main hall of your house. You can go north, south, east, west. Go north. This is where you pretend to work. You can go south. You see a safe. Examine safe. It is a very heavy locked box. There is a keyhole on it. The safe is locked. Unlock safe. You unlock the safe. Open safe. You open the safe. Examine safe. It is a very heavy locked box. There is a keyhole on it. The safe is open. The safe contains a letter. Get letter from safe. You picked up the letter from the safe. Examine letter. It reads you win. That's a pretty nice little uh, application there to demonstrating something that you can do with speech. Uh, there's other things, obviously, that you can do with speech, but um, you know that's just you know example that uh, might prove useful. Um, having a conversation with the user uh, can really help uh, keep their context inside things, as well as in this case, they don't have to type. Um, a lot of this can now be done inside the Google Assistant. You can uh, write extensions for the Assistant and processors or services. I can't remember what they call them, and uh, you know, you could play a game very similar to this inside the Google Assistant. Uh, and the, the Assistant may have a little bit better speech recognition built in with it, uh, as well as the, the, the voice coming out. Um, there's different voice models you can use when you're speaking. Uh, this is just kind of a basic voice model. Um, but uh, you can actually install other voice models as well. So any questions on this? I just wanted to kind of go quickly through this one just to give some feel for what it can do. Okay, so that's our speech module. Close that project. And I'm not going to need him anymore, so let me unplug the phone. And let's see. I also wanted to talk about files today. <clears throat> let's go ahead and bring this one over. And this one I don't have any slides for. But there's a few different types of things I wanted to, to demonstrate with files here. So one thing that, it, that may be very useful is the uh, data storage training that's uh, built into developer.android.com. Uh, it's got some uh, uh, information about different ways to deal with files, where files can be uh, gotten from, and things like that. Um, I've also got a couple icons that I just uh, pulled in here and just had the, the references for them up here, the, the attribution. Um, so what's happening inside this app? Let's see, do I want to do it this way or do I want to actually type some stuff? Um, well, let me show you what the application looks like first.
it's not pretty. <laughs> it's it's functional, but not not pretty. Okay, so I have a bunch of uh, uh, buttons on here for writing files and reading files. Um, the basic read and write depends on where you want to actually write the information. Every application, let me actually bring up a little scratch file here. And we'll make it plain text. There we go. Every application has some spots that it can write its data to. Some of that data is going to be private to the application. Some is going to be more public. Um, private information for the application is actually stored in a path called data, data, application ID, files, and then something inside that files directory. Similar for database. Was it data or database? I can't remember if it's data or a database is the name of the directory on that. Um, but these are directories that are actually hidden from anybody except for the author of the application. Um, each application, when it's installed on Android, gets its own user ID. And it protects its data in the Linux data structure behind the scenes using that user ID. So other applications can't see your ID at all. Somebody plugging their phone in to their computer can't see the data on it at all. The only time that you can look at that is either through the application, so the application goes and gets its own data and displays it, or if you've installed a debug version of the application, you're allowed to change into that uh, uh, directory. So let's see. Let me bring over, uh, actually I can do it on here, I think. I'll just use this terminal. So in this terminal, what I'd like to do is be able to jump into that emulator and take a look at the data on, on it. Um, well, we can also, if I go to Device File Explorer, um, we can take a look at data, data, and then what did I call this application? Let's see, com Java Dude Files. Surprise, surprise. So if I come in here and go to com Java Dude Files and look underneath it, you can see this files directory and any files that I write are going to appear inside of there if I'm using the normal private file system. Um, let's go ahead and use the emulator to write those files. I'm going to hit write files and I have it set up to write inside there. And if I synchronize that, I'll see inside there I created this directory called my stuff with some sample files inside there. So these are all private to the application. If I go to the terminal, and then jump over to that uh, device. So if I say ADB shell, uh, ADB is not recognized. Let's see, where do I have the SDK installed? So if I'm on my D drive, I can go to Android SDK platform tools and run ADB. This is the Android debug bridge. It's what's used to push files to and from. It's what's used to install applications and so on. Or you can just create a shell and just jump right onto that device. And if I take a look at where I am, I'll see I'm in the root of the device. I can take a look at which files are in there. If I try to go to data slash data slash com dot java dude dot files and then do an ls, actually where am I? Oh, it said permission denied when I tried to change there. So I can't go in there right now. Now, if I have the device, uh, if the application is in debug mode, I can do a run as, which is kind of, kind of like doing a sudo. I can say run as com.javadude.files. And that puts me into a subshell here in which I now have permission of that application. And if I take a look, it actually put me into that directory. So it's in that data data directory for com Java dude files. And now I can actually go in and take a look at the files and we'll see that I have my stuff. And I could say cat sample.txt, boom. Uh, whoops, sample one.txt. 
And there we go. So there's the text that I wrote out from the application. Um, it's protected unless you're installed in debug mode, and then you can do this type of thing. If you're not, if the application is not installed in debug mode, you won't be able to do this. No one will be able to do this. The data can only be accessed by that application. Now they've recently done this so that, let's go to my scratch here. Um, they've uh, also set it up so that you have application private space on, oops, on the SD card. And so on the SD card, there's a directory called Android slash data slash com dot Java dude. Well, it's the application ID. That's also owned by your uh, by your application. Um, that used to be wide open to anybody who's looking at anything. If anything's on the SD card, anybody can look at it. But they've been sandboxing this now, and so you have to actually use something called the storage access framework to be able to access data on the SD card in various spots. Uh, this directory is protected by default, and then you can put data in other external directories, either for everybody to use or for nobody to use. Um, if we take a look on this, let me actually go back to the emulator. Let's say that I'm going to I can't remember if this is the one that I, let me look at the code for a second. So we've got this read file and write files. So it's called write files and read files. Um, these ones, let's go ahead and take a look at what the code looks like for that. So when I wanted to write the files out, so those sample files there, I'm doing this in a suspend function with a with context for dispatchers IO, because I'm going to be doing file IO. I don't want to hold up my user interface. I'm going to go and get a subdirectory using the normal Java file syntax. So this file object is what's called an abstract file name. It isn't actually the file itself. It just represents a name and a path on the file system. You can use it to open up files, to write text, to read text, and things like that. But really, all he is is a, uh, an abstract file name. And so here, I'm using filesdir as my parent directory with child stuff underneath it. So let's take a look at what filesdir is. This is defined by default inside the context you're in, the Android context. This context is the activity that's running in there. And so this is actually going to return a directory where I can write files privately, private for the application. So that's filesdir. I'm creating my own one by calling subdir.makedirs underneath there. And then I'm going to write some files out. And there's a bunch of ways you can write files in Kotlin. You're, we're just using straight Kotlin support to write these guys out. So here I'm creating an abstract file name inside my subdirectory for sample1.txt. And one of the ways I can write, if the text isn't super, super long, we can just go ahead and call write text and that writes the entire file. So this is meaning the file is gonna be exactly this text here. And I'm using a raw string in Kotlin here to have different spacing inside of it and so on. Trim indent will strip off the shortest leading indent from all lines. So in this case, the shortest leading indent here is going to be, what is that, 12? Yeah, so 12 spaces is going to take off each line, which means it'll take 12 spaces off there and actually indent on the, another line there. You could alternatively use trim margin and use an explicit pipe character or some other character to be a margin represented. So this is going to completely write the file just by saying file write text. And that only works if you can really generate all the text together like that. If you've got a lot of text, you're not going to want to do that. You're going to want to write out chunks of it at a time. And that's where you start to get into like the next form over here. So we have file2, which is another abstract file name for sample2.txt in that same directory. And this time I'm going to create a file writer. Now in Java, there's two types of ways to write data. You can uh, use a writer or you can use an output stream. Output stream is binary data. A writer is character data. So uh, in here, this is actually going to get a writer using the native um, 
uh, uh, character encoding for this platform and uh, write that out. Or actually, um, was that a good, was that a correct statement or not? Or is it going to always, use, yeah, so it's going to take whatever the characters that you're writing, which are in UTF-8, and it's going to write them out using the character encoding for this platform. So this will write them out. This guy here creates the writer to go out there, and the use function makes sure that it's going to be closed. It's super, super important that you always close all of your files. If you don't, you leave file handles open, and that restricts what other applications can write out because there's a limited number of file handle resources on the system. By doing a use, this Lambda is executed and when the Lambda is done, it closes whatever writer was passed to it as a, as a receiver. So always, always, always use this use to, to do your writing there. So we're gonna have our writer and then inside of here, we're just gonna call writer.write to write things out. In this case, it's writing out multiple strings we're going to write out all these numbers. And if we take a look at that sample2.text, we'll see all those numbers came out here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, because we're just writing them. We're not doing any type of, of line feeds on these guys. Now, if we wanted to, we could actually use a print writer, which is where Printlin comes from. And Printlin prints out the thing that we want to write, followed by a line terminator. And the line terminator it uses is going to be appropriate for whatever platform you're on. So if you're doing it on Linux, it's going to be just the, the backslash n, the line feed. If you're doing it on Windows, it's going to be the backslash r, backslash n. If you're doing it on the Mac, it's just going to be the backslash r. So each platform has its own way of doing that. And so this print writer is going to, again, walk through 1 to 10 and print stuff up. So if I look at sample 3, We'll see that each of them got on a separate line because of that print line. <coughs> okay, this last one here for, for number four, we're gonna do something a little extra special about this. We're creating this thing called an uppercase writer. And this is a filter that works on top of a file. If you think of all these writers and filters in Java as, uh, and I'm saying Java here because we're actually using the Java support behind the scenes. Um, if you think of all of these as coffee filters, and you have coffee filters that can, you know, nest on top of each other. So when you pour water on the top, it goes through however many filters before it gets to the end. Each of those filters modifies its data. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating an uppercase writer, which I'll show you in a moment, wrapped around a buffered writer. And a buffered writer is actually a type of writer that wraps around the base writer. So what a buffered writer does is as you pour content into it, it gradually fills up the buffer. When the buffer is full, it will then dump that huge chunk to the underlying file or the you know, whatever's at, after there. Um, this is much, much better for writing out to a file system. If you just write out individual characters, it's horribly inefficient. Uh, the, uh, the hard disks and other types of uh, storage mechanisms are meant to write blocks of data at a time to be more efficient. And by using a buffered writer, you can help that efficiency. So underneath this, it's got the actual writer, which is writing to the file. The buffered writer buffers the information. The uppercase writer is going to convert all the characters into uppercase. So let's take a look at this guy. So this is a little uh, writer that I wrote. It's called a, it's based on a filter writer. And this is creating something called a decorator pattern. It implements the same interface as writer. If we take a look at writer here, we'll see that he has the same functions. So we have a public write with an integer, a write with a character buffer, and a write with a string. And this guy implements those same features. The decorator pattern is wrapping an object around another object that has the same interface. So you're just changing the behavior as something goes through. So if I write to the uppercase writer, anytime I write a character, I convert it to an uppercase and then pass it to the writer underneath the scenes. Um, that's what filter writer does, this, this super class. He just says, pass the data to the, uh, the, the contained class. Similar with writing a character buffer, I'm gonna create, uh, write that to a, oh, actually, I missed something on this. 
Oh no, he's actually calling this other one. Okay, so I'm converting the character buffer to a string and then calling this function. This function uppercases it and then passes it through. And we have an offset and a length there, so you can actually print write out chunks of that uh, that buffer instead of the entire buffer at once if you want to. So just by doing these few operators here, I'm changing the output before it goes to the actual uh, filter out there. And so the data should be all uppercased. And if we take a look at sample 4.txt, we'll see that all the text there got spit to uppercase, even though inside the file here, I had mixed case. So this is one of the things you can do with the IO uh, library in Java is be able to modify things using a decorator pattern. It's really nice that way. Now the print writer, just as a by the way, is an adapter pattern because we're not overriding the same function names, we're adding in new function names. So it's a different, a different API being passed to it. Okay, so that ends up writing these things out to those subdirectories here. Now the next one that we had inside here, it says get external files dir. So this is actually getting the directory that this application owns on a hard drive, or sorry, on, a, on an SD card. So on the SD card, we're gonna get that directory create our own external stuff directory, and then put things inside of it. So we're just gonna write this external stuff inside there. So if I go back into here, and I try to go to slash SD card, oh, I guess I can't go there. Does he even have one? Um, actually, let's exit out from the application for the moment. So here's what the SD card looks like. And if I go into Android, I can see the data directory inside there. And then I can go to com.javadude.files. And go to my files directory and then go to external stuff. And notice how this is all public because I'm not using the storage access framework. It's not protecting it for me. So this is a, a, a section of data where we can write things so cat sample five, boom, we're seeing that external file stuff directory or external file stuff file and life is peachy. Now, if we were using the storage access framework to go to other directories, it would protect those. So this is just the basic file writing that we've done there. And if I come back to the emulator and I say read files, what this is going to do is for each of those files, he's going to read them in a, a coroutine, spitting them up one at a time. So if we take a look at that guy, um, let's see. So there's the read files. Let's go to the read files function. And so we see this is a suspend function using dispatchers IO because we're gonna be doing IO on this guy. Delaying for a little bit. We're gonna read a file, delay for some, read the other files, delay for some, and so on. So we're just gonna see each of those printed up. So if I hit read files, it's reading these from the, the private directories, printing out the names as well. So a real simple little interface on this guy. Now let's take a look at store raw. And what this guy is gonna do is store raw and store asset are gonna pull stuff out of my application and put them in something called the media store. Now media store is a content provider inside Android. This is a top level component that allows you to manage media on your device. Anytime you add in a new directory that has images in it, the media store has the chance to index that. Um, there is a thing you can, if you put inside the directory a dot no index, is that right? It's either dot no index or dot no media. I'm, I'm blanking on which one it is right now. Uh, but if you put that in there, maybe it's no media. If you put it in there, then the media uh, uh, media store won't index that. And so you won't have those things show up. Otherwise, the media store is gonna be used to, to get all of the photos to go in your photo album, for example. And uh, anything that was indexed will go inside there. Anything that's not indexed won't go inside there. Uh, I did an application at my last company where there was a bunch of photos being uh, taken for sample collection at a sensitive site. So you know, maybe they went to uh, an enemy camp and you know cleared everybody out, 
and started collecting things and taking pictures. Um, when they took the pictures, those pictures were all in a folder for that application, and we didn't want to have those just show up in the in the random gallery because there was just too many of them. Um, we wanted them isolated to this application, and so we we made sure that the media uh, uh, the media provider didn't actually index those. The two things that I'm doing here, raw versus asset, if we come over into our res directory, we have a res raw directory here, which is just any old file you want it to be. All these other directories, there's certain types of files that can go inside of them. They're XML files, or in these case, images files. And these guys here can be anything you want it to be. Uh, you know, it could be an XML file that is whatever format you want, and it's not one that you want Android to think it knows about as far as a format. Um, but in this case, we just have a little Android image inside here. The, there's also this assets directory which you'll see how an image is as well. And the big difference between these two, underneath anything underneath res is affected by the configuration of the device. So the orientation of the device, screen size, the language of the user sets, the day or night, um, the density of the screen, things like that. Those all affect which resources are pulled. So you can have different versions of this raw directory based on configuration. The assets directory does not have that. It's just straight old files. And you typically will use these, most of the time I've seen it used, is for uh, HTML and JavaScript that you might have inside an application that's just presenting some documentation or presenting uh, you know, some other type of text that's formatted as HTML. Um, that's typically what I see assets being used for, but they could be used for several other things. The big difference is assets are not affected by the configuration resources are. So these two guys here, when I say store raw, it's actually pulling this guy. Store asset, it's pulling from the assets directory. So let's look at what those two guys do. So copy raw to media store. This guy again, we're using a, our IO dispatcher to make sure this happens off the UE thread. And I'm going to call resources, open raw resource. And resources, you can use to get drawables, you can use to get layouts, you can use to get menus, whatever. You're just reading stuff from the resources directory. Um, so we're gonna open a raw resource, which is gonna give you a input stream, that's binary data. And here's the resource ID we're using. So our raw Android one. Um, we're gonna pull that, open it up, make sure it closes it afterwards by using use. And then I'm gonna say input stream, copy to media store, passing in this guy. So let's take a look at copy to media store. This is a little function that I wrote that once again, a suspend function that runs on dispatchers IO. And this guy is going to take the data and put it into the media store. Now the way this works is that you're basically treating the media store as a database. And so we're gonna stick stuff in that database. And we're also gonna take the, the data and write it out to a URL that the database told us about. So if we take a look at this, I'm gonna to have to get our images collection, which is going to be the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 what do, how do I call it? The, 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 core, the base URL representing where stuff is gonna be going. And this varies slightly between different versions. If you were at least Android Q, you're gonna use this way to get a hold of it. If you're using anything before then, you're gonna use external content URI. Um, and this is when they started enforcing the uh, storage access framework. So this gives you your base URL. Then we're gonna create a content values map with the data about that. So we're gonna have uh, the name of the file that we wanna write out and the, um, the MIME type of that guy. This data here is gonna be put into the database. So we say here, content resolver insert, here's the URI, and then here's the data we want to throw inside there. So that's going to insert the data for us. Then I'm going to call use on this guy who is on the input stream because input stream is our uh, receiver. This will make sure that we close that input stream after we've actually written to it. So I'm going to say use on him. We're going to say content resolver. Tell me which URI to use for the, well, where did actually where did that URI come from? Um, here he is right here. So when we said insert, it gave us the URI for that item. We're gonna use that URI to actually open an output stream that the content, the content resolver owns. 
Again, another use here to make sure that that stream gets closed after we've written to it. And then we're just going to call input stream copy to output stream. And this is actually a Kotlin function, this copy to, which is going to copy all the data there. If we come and take a peek at him, you'll see that he has the typical loop that you'll see using a buffer to write data from one file to another. So that's what copy to media store is doing. And we're using that for either of these as the base of actually the writing out to the media store. The copy asset to media store is going to say assets.open, passing in a path, and then using the copy to media store. So same kind of thing. So really the difference between these two is just how they're reading the data, either open raw resource or open from assets. And so when I do those, it's going to put them into my media store. Let's uh, bring up the emulator again. I'm going to say store raw. And that's going to put the, the data into there. I'm going to store asset as well, which is going to put him in. That's the second one up here. And now if I, let's see, can I do this on the device? Do I have a, let's see if it comes up in photos now. There we go. So we'll see here that my photo album is now showing me those two icons that have been added to the, uh, the media store. So boom, they're there. Now the other thing that we can do, once I've stored those, I'm going to call dump images, which is just going to give this information here. It's just giving us the, uh, I can't, it's like an ID for these guys. So those are put out there. Now these two ones, these buttons are actually going to display those images. So we're going to read them out of the media store. Uh, let's see, android1.ping. There's the button there. So this button here is going to say, I'm going to set the image URI to finding that image. An image URI is a mutable state so that once it's set, Compose can actually display it. So let's see where he's actually being used. We'll see here we say, if we have an image URI, we're going to launch a coroutine to check the permission for reading it and then actually load it. So if we go to check permission and load, we'll see inside here. If we have permission, open it. Otherwise, we're going to do a permission launcher like we've done before. And the open image is going to use that URI and just go to the content resolver and say, hey, content resolver, where's this image? P please load that for me. So we get this input stream and we're going to convert it into a bitmap. Set that as image bitmap. Boom. We're good to go. So those buttons, if I went ahead and hit android1.ping, note that it's asking for that permission. That's what the check permission was going because I did not give it uh, fi the files, uh, the photo access permission yet. And boom, there we go. If I do this guy, it's going to return the other one. So I can just pull those out of the media store. Now for storage access framework, there's a couple things that are that's going on here. Um, for writing a file, we're going. There's, there's. You can write individual files. You can open individual files, or you can grab a hold of a subdirectory, and then you have access to that subdirectory to read and write. Each of these directories and and the items are going to be selected by the user. So the user has to get involved to say it's okay to put something somewhere. And the main reason they did this is because so many applications were just putting random things on the SD card and never cleaning up. And so by having it this way, the user is aware of what's going on. Uh, and when the applications are, are uninstalled, it automatically deletes these things for us. So what we're gonna do for the writing for this file, we've got this document launcher that I've created, and we're gonna launch it with this simple SAF one. What he does is he's registering for activity result, and hey, this contract is deprecated. I'm going to have to uh, find the, the current one now. Um, so inside here, we're going to register for activity result to create the intent that actually launches to the, the storage access framework to do things. We specify here um, that we're going to create an intent with a category and a type text plane. So this is going to be the... Um, 
uh, where what what the user is going to choose file wise. So when we launch this intent, it's going to open up a file chooser for the user to say where do I want to put this, and we're going to pass in the uh, initial file name and let the user say where they want to put in a plain text file. So let's see what that guy does. Storage access framework right. It goes to the file chooser. And one of the problems I have with this, and I've, and I've got to push a little more internally to fix this, is that there's no indication on here what the user's doing. It just gives them a, here, file chooser. Uh, and most platforms will have at least a title at the top saying, where do you want to save the file? Uh, just so the user knows what they're doing. So typically what you'll want to do in between these steps is bring up a dialogue saying, I'm going to give you a file chooser. Please tell me where you want to choose the save the file and then go ahead and launch this. Uh, otherwise, the user may not really know why this popped up. So in this case, the user can choose where they want to go, downloads the default directory here, but I can go to my SD card and choose a different directory. Um, like let's say I want to put it into movies. I'm going to save it there. And now if I go to the device file explorer and go to SD card movies, I'm um, going to do a sync here. Um, actually, it's not going to because the uh, it doesn't have permission. Let me do a, a, the read. There's movies. So why actually wasn't that showing? That should show under SD car movies. Oh, I guess it's because the storage access framework, it's not gonna be able to see this. It's has to go through the storage access framework to get to the data inside of there. So yeah, you're not gonna be able to see it inside this. And if I go to the terminal here, actually let's just go to slash SD card and movies, and we'll notice that we can't see it. Storage access framework is hiding it. So if I go back here and say, I'm trying to read it, I can choose it. And now it's printing out the, the information there because the storage access framework is giving us access to look, look at it. It's totally up to the user to choose what stuff is available to the application at this point. Now the tree version over here so I went to this open document. He has the content resolver open input. The tree one, he's gonna go right via tree. The idea here is that the user can choose a directory. And once we have access to that directory, we can read and write from it at will. That's actually, if you have to write a lot of files, uh, is a really good idea. It, it really helps out the application a lot. Um, what that application I was talking about that took a lot of photos before, um, I was throwing those into a directory on the SD card. And if I had to ask every single time, where do I put this photo? Where do I put this photo? The user would go insane. So when I converted it to storage access framework, I had to come in here and add a support like this to say, let me get access to this specific directory. And so the user chooses the directory once. And from that point on, the application's free to use it. So we'll see here, this right via tree, tree URI, this is a little prop preference that I'm gonna be storing. If I don't have one, so if it's initially null, I'm gonna to need to generate that tree URI. But if I do have it, I can just open it again. So what this uh, property setup is doing here is I'm saying that whenever somebody asks for the tree URI, I'm gonna to go to the preference manager and get the tree URI string, otherwise return null. So it's gonna return the string for that URI. If somebody wants to set it, I'm directly setting it in the uh, the preference manager as well. And so in this guy here, he's gonna put that tree URI string. So if I have a tree URI, I'm gonna convert it to a URI or if there's no permission, null. So here's this function that I wrote to do to URI or null if no permission. How's that for nice and wordy? Um, I'm gonna ask the content resolver, do I have permissions for this? If I do, I'm gonna parse the URI, otherwise I'm gonna return a null. So it just allows me to chain this with the permission check in the middle, which is kind of nice. Um, if I do have permission, 
then I can create a file called create a file in the tree. If I didn't have a URI or no permission, then I have to go ahead through this OpenSAF document tree launcher that I created and try to find a place to put it. So if I come in here, this guy is going to register for open document tree. And when I get a response back, if the user chose a URI, I'm going to set it in my preferences. And then I'm going to ask the content uh, resolver to hold on to it for me. So this flag grant read URI and flag grant write is our way of asking, please let me keep reading and keep writing from this. And so we go to the content resolver. We call take persistible URI permission to do that and then create the file inside of a, a coroutine. So if we go and click this SAF tree, it takes us to a chooser and notice how it says use this folder. The user has to choose what folder they want to put it in. If I try to go up to the root, note that it says can't use this folder. You know, you have to choose some kind of folder that's a subfolder underneath the SD card. So let's create a new folder. I'm going to call it SAF1. And then I'm going to say use this folder. And once again, having some instructions on the screen would really help. So now it's asking allow files to access, allow files, the application, to access the files in SAF1. This will let files access current and future content stored. The user can now say, yeah, that's cool. Or not. And boom, now that's written out there. So I think if I hit it again, it's putting new files inside there. And we'll see that it's adding in a little ID on the end of those guys. And that's the basic stuff where there's a dump. I guess that's what it's dumping right now is all this stuff, just joining them together every time I hit it. Um, so that's the basic types of reads and writes you can do. You can do them into local directories, which the application will hide underneath the, the, the main root. You can use storage access framework, which is up to the, the user to say where to put the permission. Um, you can uh, read and write information from your actual application that you have packaged. You can take those and write it out to the file system for whatever reason you want to. Um, and you can use storage access framework to read and write files or read and write trees. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, well, that is all I had to cover. Um, if there are any questions on the homework or anything like that, which is due next week, please let me know, uh, ask on the discussion forums. And, um, you know, again, when you put on the discussion forums, please send me an email as well, just to let me know that there's something there. Uh, and then I'll go look at the discussion forums because every once in a while I'm not getting notification and I'm not sure what's going on. Sometimes I do. Uh, but every once in a while I, I check and there's one that's, I didn't have a notification for. Okay. Have a great week. I'll see you all next week.